Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That was a wind. An English wind of the winter of 1684. A shutter rattler of a wind. And it gets under doors and into houses and into rooms. And when it does this, it's known as a searching wind. It worries a door all night long and tinkles crockery hanging on hooks and searches some more. And finally, it finds what it was looking for. (laughs) This particular wind just found John and Judith and made them cold and made them shiver and made them hate each other. Uh... As a matter of fact, this particular wind made them sorry they'd ever killed anybody and gotten into this situation in the first place. So, tonight... My report to you on John and Judith, their crime, and why they didn't get to enjoy it. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. Our scene is the country town of Snitton in the parish of Bitterly, near the confluence of the Teem and Corve River. The scene, in fact, later immortalized in Henry Luddy's singing stanzas. Indeed, it was a veritable Henry Luddy setting which concerns us here. Summer, heather, gorse, larks on the bow and on the wing, primroses, violas, and maiden fern, squirrels gathering and putting away, gophers and quail. Summerly and a smile, Luddy's very words. And in the middle of this sonnet of summer, right in the middle of it, where the sun shone the most golden, there was a house. And in this house was a kitchen, and in the kitchen was a maid, a hired help, that is. And making love to the maid was John Cupper, Mrs. Cupper's husband, that is. Mrs. Cupper being at the market at the moment. Oh, now you get to one side, do, so I can get back to that kettle. That was Judith, the hired help. Oh, fie the kettle. Give me a lippy do. And that was John Cupper, the man who hired her. Ah, sweet one, Judy girl. Ah, oh, and, and sweet it was. Unwind from me, John. The kettle needs doing. And the silver tray needs shining. You can scour and shine another day. Uh, and your wife will be coming home any time. Unwind from oh, me. Oh, she'll not be coming home for a while. Oh, smart one, beant you? And how do you know that? <laughs> I gave her farthing enough to buy two melons, oh. Two large melons, oh. And walking back with them, little girl. Little Judy will take a longer time, I tell you. Oh, smarty, smarty, <laughs> smarty. smarty. <laughs> no, 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 John. Oh, why not? I just told you that me. A verse, John. Hmm? Like you do. But like you haven't done for a week now. I want me a verse. Oh, so smart you are. <laughs> We play the game, John. All right. Uh, Judith walks in the other, light as a feather. <laughs> yeah, come closer. It's the game. Uh, she uh, she uh, she makes a gay song as she happens along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Judith Judith goes like God. Ah, Judy Judy girl, give us a lippy do. Ah, oh, Judy girl. Oh, John. Uh, well, now, oh, I should have knocked. I should have knocked and called out. Now, good wife Smith, I was helping the uh, elf here nanny, to... Nanny, nanny, nanny! You uh, go about your work, Judith, and if the dust in you is in your eye, it still troubles you, well, then... It... Dust in the eye, nanny. I pray you, good wife Smith, mention none of this now. Now, why do you stand here, Judith, to your work? <clears throat> good wife Smith. What business is it of mine that you make merry with your maid? I will not tell your wife. And I must leave anyhow, at once, almost. As soon as I have got what I came for. Anything. Butter. A paddling. And 
put it on that silver tray the wench is shining and listen to me. I'll return only the butter. Huh? Do it, sir. Give it to me. Now. Yes. Goodwife Smith placed the silver tray in one tight little fist and went singing... nanny o nanny o nanny o day. Right out the door. John and Judith sulked for the next half hour, after which Mrs. Cupper made her entrance. John! John, open the door! I'm heavy with melons and cannot reach! And good melons they were. So supper was had, and after the dishes were cleared by Judith, and the floor swept by Judith, and the pot scoured, and the hearth cleaned and scrubbed, and the linen folded and put aside... Judith? Yes, Goody Copper? You can eat your supper now. Then you can have the night off. Yes, Goody Copper. (laughs) And mind you, the lads from Shropshire down the road. Uh, Mind you, girl. Yes, sir. And later... After Judith had gone. I like me our maid, John. What? Our maid, Judith. She's a good one. No, uh, if you say it, she is. John. Yes? Next year will be four years we're married. Yes. And my father wagged me it would end before it was one year old. But I know. Oh. My father was a wrong wagger, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Ah, coming home from marketing the good thoughts of this warm house and my love for you choked up in me, and so I knighted Judith off. I thought, John, you remember? John! Yes? Where is the silver tray? Uh, What, my love? The silver tray which Grandfather Wheeler gave to us the day before he was so untimely. Oh. Well, where is it? I gave it to Silversmith to ungreen it. Oh, good, John. Thoughtful, John. John. Yes. Alone we are. John. Mm, it's a warm night, Anna, and I... I uh... Oh, and I shiver. Hold close to me. <sighs> well... And remember the warm night of Heather? Yes. And the game you taught me to play? The verse you made, and closer I would come? Ah, uh, speak no more of it, I pray you. Then what would you do tonight, John? Well, don't vex me, woman. Suddenly I have bile inside and it bitters me. Yeah, I'll sit till it's time for bed. You do what you want. <sighs> yes, John, yes. And Goody Cupper lighted a candle and walked upstairs and went to her bed. She kneeled beside it and pressed her cheek against the pillow. And later she dressed into her fresh linen nightgown and went to bed and let the warmth of the night drift over her. And she slept. Her husband, on the other hand, waited up for the hired help. He paced the living room, and when that produced no Judith, he went outside and paced the garden, which got better results. Judith. You. Hey, shh. Shh. Where are you been? Shropshire. Ah, with those lads all about. There's no sweet lads like you, John, and you know it. Hmm. You tipple. And what did you think I'd do? And where did you get the money to buy? Answer me that. I'll tell you. I'll tell you true. In Barbara Mercy's alehouse I was. Hmm. And there I sat with folded hands and looking prim and smoothed down my linen from time to time. And I would look up and, and there would be a frothy pewter. Some lad bought you ale. There was three. Three lads? 
One was golden, one was dark, and one was big old. Oh, yeah, you joke to me. Come to me. How uh, they fighted for me and bloodied each other and, and walked off arm in arm. Oh, listen, there's Heather tonight, Judy. Were well, you my husband? What? Goody Copper owns a feather bed, and I sleep on rags and wood. And let me tell you, John, Barbara Mercy said to marry you, and she's the one who knows. Night, John. You wait. What for? I have already a wife. And you can't get another till you're rid of her. Mm, true. I mean, rid of her. How? I did not ask Barbara Mercy that. Perhaps you should. Perhaps I should. And Judy, Judy girl, love... Do not Judy girl love me. I go to my rags and wood. Night, Master Copper. And later, John went into the house... But he hardly slept a wink. Next day, he traveled down to Shropshire, where a lad pointed out Barbara Mercy's alehouse. He told her his trouble and asked her how to solve it. And Barbara Mercy said, Ah, snake. And John was amazed and said, What? And Barbara Mercy, who was a patient woman, laid it out to him. Ah, snake. Poison my wife? Ah, snake. Where can I get some? Ah, snake. But where can I get some? Why, right here. It was noon when John got back to his house and opened the door wide to a domestic scene that would have warmed the cockles of a less disturbed man. Judith was churning, and his wife Hannah was crocheting a centerpiece to put on the silver tray after it had been ungreened and returned by the silversmith. Churning, crocheting, and sweet summer smells and sweet... Bliss. Oh, goody. Oh, John. Oh, wench. Oh, Master Copper. And what did you do in Shropshire Town, John? Oh, to see a kegler. We'll be needing kegs come griping time. Aye. Wench. Yes, goody Copper. Have you got butter yet? Master Copper will want butter on his loaf for lunching. Aye, soon, soon. I thirst. Well, there's milk in the larder there. Wench, fetch. I'll fetch. And I'll bring you some, too. Yes, Goody. It's a good husband I've got. Yes, Goody. My advice to you is to get a husband just as good. Ah, good provider and a thoughtful man. Oh, John, I just said you were a thoughtful man. Tadio, drink your milk. Thoughtful man. But to drink. All of it for the coolness of it. <gasps> What is it, Goody? Uh, uh, you just uh, drain Goody and your face whitened. Help me. You'll be poisoned, Goody, and there's no help for you. Help me. Help me. I had to do it to you, Anna. I tired of you and I love me Judy girl. Well, now, oh, what do you do, Goody Copper, on kitchen floor lying so? Die. What? Die. They poisoned me. Poisoned you, you say? And you're dying? Yes. Yes. <sighs> and I... Think you're dead, Goody Copper. John Copper? Yes. And what will you do with her fine things? Her pretty though, her jewels. What will you do with them? The question hung there for a few seconds, and then John didn't do a thing but turn around and run upstairs and gather together all his wife's pretty o's and jewels and gave them to Goody Smith. She tucked them under her arm and went singing... Nadio, 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 Nadio,
right out of the door. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Tomorrow night, Marlena Dietrich, as Diane LaVolta, European mystery woman, becomes enmeshed in a drama surrounding a valuable Stradivarius violin. It's another exciting romantic adventure for the lady with a roving disposition and a magnetic attraction for men. On CBS Radio's Time for Love, starring Marlena Dietrich. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics. And his report to you on John and Judith, their crime, and why they didn't get to enjoy it. England in 1684. Charles II was on the throne, and when he wasn't on it, he was entertaining variously Nell Gwynne, Lucy Walter, the Duchess of Cleveland, and the Duchess of Portsmouth. It was a prosperous time in England. Spices and gold and tobacco and silver and precious jewels were pouring in from India, and the government was sending brightly colored and highly polished beads and discipline back in return. You'll remember that it was about this time when young Sir Broderick Danley put down an insurrection in Ceylon without a fatality, he and his men being armed only with bull whips. The richness of empire was reflected everywhere on the British Isles. The rich got richer. And in the countryside, prosperity was evident too. The lush field, the busy churneries, the heavily laden honeycombs. In the town of Snitton, in the parish of Bitterly, there was a house. And on the floor of this house was a corpse. Well, it's done. Oh, not quite done, John. I'm still a single woman. Ah, after the burying, a month past that and we'll wed. Oh, and I will be good wife Judith Copper. <laughs> Goody Copper. Oh, I like the sound of it. But don't you close to me till I'm called that, John Copper. Called that by the neighbors and all the townspeople all about. Judy... I. She's coming again. I can see her on the path through the window. Goody Smith. Oh, she's a greedy woman, John. Yes. To be feared. Hello. What want you now? A question to ask. Which is? Who's to do the burying of her? Who's to do the building of the coffin and the digging of the grave? In Shropshire Town, there's a lad who... In Snitton here, close to you, there's a lad too. Brother to me, a young lad starting up a trade. He'll build you a stout coffin and dig you a deep hole and cover it up again. For how much will he do? Twenty pounds. Which is four times what the lad from... We'll do it. Then I'll send him to you. Give me the 20 pounds, please. Now, it must be said that although Goody Smith's brother Fenton was a willing lad, he was not too bright. Plus the fact that he had never done this sort of work before. Mostly, he had just roamed about and scared people. Well... He made the casket too small and of an inferior grade of lumber cut with crude craftsmanship so that an alarming accident took place at the internment. A carpenter had to be summoned from Shropshire to repair the damage. But the grave had been dug so deep and so narrow that he wouldn't get in it. And so Goody Cupper got buried in a faulty coffin. And a month later, there was a new Goody Cupper. John, I'm so happy. So am I, Judy girl. I... Hello! Make heap of your wedding pewter. I'll take it home with me. This was in August, and in September... I broke my churner, Goody Copper. Oh, but how will I... Have your husband bring it to me if that's what you wanted to ask. Always did like that churner you use. And in October, the early part... My brother's outside with cart, John Copper. The constable says I must keep him indoors. That rocker you're rocking on's always been a favorite of his. And in October, the later part. 
It seems to me that soon you'll have nothing left. Which is true, Barbara Mercy. Uh, last night she took dining table and all the chairs around it. Listen. When Barnabas howls, tis a bitter cold that spills from the moors. A bitter winter's coming in. Aye. When coming here, we saw the ice had formed on the river team where it touched the corve. I've answer for you. Tell us. Arsenic. I thought you would give us counsel in such a way, Barbara Mercy. Arsenic. Aye, and here is money. Arsenic. You have said it, Barbara Mercy. There is no need to look thus. You have said it. What? Here is the money for the poison, Barbara Mercy. Oh, teddy I've got it right here in me apron. Here. Ah, Snake. Ah, Taddy-o. taddy Barbara Mercy. Ooh, it's cold, Judy girl, love. In a dismal time. Oh, soon it'll be warm, John. Oh, soon. Ah, but yet it grows colder by the minute. <laughs> Light as a feather and makes a gay song as she happens along. Singing gay, nonny oh, nonno, nonny oh day. Singing, sing with me, Goody Smith. Singing gay, nonny oh, nonno day, nonny. Oh, he cuts a caper, your husband John does. The way he does. <laughs> 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 It's a dancer you are, John Cooper. Is that why you invited me to your house? To see you at Caper? Ah, uh, to enjoy you, Goody Smith, to party with you, as neighborly does. And you bear me no malice for my borrowing, do you? Bear you malice? Now, why should I do that? Such a neighbor as you is a, is a rare one indeed. Oh, ah, my gullet's dry and it's a wet it needs, uh, Let's drink our ale and a mullet, Judy, with your poker. Ah, yes. Uh, this one is yours, Goody Smith. Uh, drink you and we'll all drink. In truth? In truth. Yeah, this one is yours. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Why, why did you spill the ale? <laughs> Goody Smith, why did you? Oh, it's festive, I feel. Oh, oh. I'll fetch more <laughs> ale. And we'll spill it. What aches you, Goody Smith? There's not a thing that aches. Nor will there be. I have seen your first wife die, John Cupper, from a poison. And I want none of it for myself. No, you will not murder me. I will take the copper cups tonight. Fetch them. Fetch them now, for the festive is over and I'm going home. <laughs> And an hour after that, the Team River froze over. That's how cold it got. Any dogs that had howled outside had stopped howling. They'd frozen to death. John and Judith moved the mattress downstairs near the fireplace and huddled together under their last feather quilt. And John and Judith shivered. <laughs> and their teeth chattered. And they stuck their heads under the blanket and fought a subtle little battle about who would get most of the warmth. Get up and stir the fire, John. Well, there's hardly what to stir. This morning she made me deliver all the firewood. Oh, don't, you stupid. What would you have me do? Would you... Inside, Reginald, quickly. And close the door. Hello. And well now, oh, to sleep by the fire, I see. Go away, Goody Smith, for the love of heaven, go away. Oh, my brother Fenton is here. He tires of rocking. He wishes to lie down. And I have neither mattress nor feather quilt for him. Oh, viper, you snake of the world. 
Oh, greatest foul. Dear Goody Copper, how the cold has made you forget. I have forgot nothing. Her go get out. Oh, tell her, John, tell her. Oh, yeah, get out. You get nothing more. Get out. Very well. Come, Fenton. <laughs> Oh, Judy girl, no, Judy girl, Judy girl. Come in quickly, whoever you be. And who may you be, sir? I am King's Constable. On what mission, sir? To read a warrant. On, on what charge, sir? Murder. Well, then read it and get on with it. On the complaint of good wife Sarah Smith of the town of Snitton in the parish of Bitterly. That John Copper did horribly contrive with his maidservant Judith, now his wife, in poisoning his then wife Anna, that these two shall be taken to the assizes in Shrewsbury and there tried. Come along. They were too cold to protest. It was warm in jail and there was a hot broth. Facts which suffused them with such a sense of well being that they confessed everything. Oh, uh, I put the white arsenic in the milk and uh, chucked her beneath the chin as she drank it down. Uh, but it was my idea. I said to him, kill your wife, John. And so I did, and I I felt no remorse for it since I loved Judith. Mm, uh, and I loved John, oh, which is why we needed to destroy Goody Copper. Uh, whoa, you, we murdered my wife. There's, there's no doubt of it at all. Poisoned her. Oh, I'm getting warm, John, oh. She was burned at the stake and reduced to ashes. John was hung in chains, but on a warm spring day, and he seemed to be smiling. Goody Smith attended his execution, and for some reason or another, she claimed his body. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. John and Judith, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed by Bernard Herman and conducted by Lud Gluskin, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as John, Betty Harford as Judith, and Jeanette Nolan as Goody Smith. Featured in the cast were Irene Tedrow, Norma Varden, and Alec Harford. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Hyland. Next week in this time, you will hear a special documentary show. And two weeks from tonight, I'll be back to tell you about the high seas in those years from 1736 to 1738. We will concern ourselves with two fun-loving fellows who wanted to steal a ship, a large one. It's listed in my files as Coyle and Richardson, why they hung in a spanking breeze. Thank you. Good night. Stay tuned now for a special CBS radio broadcast, a history-making on-the-spot pickup of President Eisenhower's news conference in Washington, D.C. CBS radio newsman George Herman, White House correspondent, will introduce the news conference immediately following station identification on most of these same stations. Hear the first broadcast of a presidential news conference. Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, has heard Friday nights on the CBS radio network. <laughs>